much. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. 30. 30. 30. I just ate some Spanish food. So I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> day, third day. No, I don't, I don't know what that has to do with anything. But I love it, by the way. Um, let's go ahead and read Matthew chapter 20, uh, ch- uh, chapter 5, verses 27. I want you to look at it. It says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her committed adultery already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and, that, and not the whole body, thy whole body, should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if I, it has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to be in your house tonight. And uh, Lord, uh, I thank you, God, that we have some faithful folks, uh, Lord, that came back here in just a little bit. And, uh, Lord, they came back to hear uh, the Word of God preached and to fellowship and to sing and worship you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, You know, in the most historic wars uh, in history, if you study, I love history, and if you read about historic wars and during the medieval times and even during the Bible times, those wars were, the enemy would always try to attack at the gate. If they could get through the gates of the city, then they could more than likely conquer that city. And tonight, this evening rather, I'd like to just give you a thought on guarding your gates. Guarding your gates. Um, I think here in Matthew chapter 5, we see that Jesus is uh, addressing some things and he's uh, talking about the gate to our soul, the gate to our life, and that is entered in through the eyes. And I believe if we had gates in our own personal life, it would be through the eye gate. And uh, look at verse number 28, if you say, but Jesus said, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her committed adultery with her already in his heart. Notice that this gate, now some of you that wondering what a gate is, uh, as far as the dictionary says, a gate is a hinged barrier used to close an opening in a wall, a fence, or a hedge. So everybody here, I believe, would understand what a gate is. It's an opening that is used to uh, as a barrier. And I remember we uh, had a dog years ago uh, in North Carolina when I was a kid, and um, we had collies, border collies, beautiful dogs. But I remember we had a big fence in the back of our yard, and I remember the guy who cut our grass for the church, he left the gate. He didn't t- put the latch all the way down. And the dog knocked the gate hinge open and ran out and got hit by a car and died. And, you know, it really left a a horrible impression on me, very always protect my gate. When I had a gate to the fence, I had more dogs in it. Later on, I grew up and we had a couple more dogs. But I always made sure that latch was down and that the gate was secure. Not only for my dog on the inside, but how about the enemy on the outside? Well, then we've got a gate that God has given us called the eye gate. And we have some things. It's, it, Jesus here is addressing it. He's, he's saying that whosoever looketh upon a woman, this is not a passing glance, but it's a lingering view. It's not one thing, you know, the Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Well, yes, that's right. Setting it before means to look upon it. If you're in Walmart and you're sitting at the checkout counter and you look over to your left and you see a a magazine rack, and it has a woman on it that's not dressed right. Well, you turn away and you say, Lord, I'm man, I need to get away from that or not look at that. But if you go and look at it again and fix your eyes upon it, that's what he's talking about. Boy, I'm going to keep looking at that. I hope nobody sees. Let me pick that up and look. Yeah. That's looking to lust. And you're committing adultery. Now, people talk about the law being more stricter than grace. But this is, again, this is Jesus Christ himself saying, hey, The law says if you commit adultery with someone, then you're worthy of being stoned and and all that. You're committing adultery. But I say that if you even look upon a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery. 
My goodness. I mean, that's, that's, again, that's what the Bible says. So it's not a passing glance, but it's a lingering view. It's not an accidental sight, but an intentional occupation with the object. The Lord is dealing with another enlargement of the old law. And He's demanding purity of life. Not just purity of action, but He's demanding purity of life. So He's telling us, hey, uh, your, your actions, you know, yes, that's what dealt with the law, but I'm dealing with your purity of your thought life. Now think about this for a second. But the new requires purity of thought life. We have an internal situation. Galatians 5.17 For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would do. So constant war. What's that war? In you? I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about me. My flesh is constantly at war with the spirit of God. Amen. It's constantly saying, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. But the Spirit of God said, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Why? There's a war. The old nature and the new nature, right? Constant war. And then there's a contrary nature. The flesh and the Spirit. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought. Every thought bringing into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So bringing it, arresting every thought. So many men that I deal with, so many teenage boys that I've dealt with through the years, preacher, my thought life, my thought life. You know why? They've not given their thoughts over to Christ. So many people are messed up in their thinking. They think wicked thoughts. They've never captured them and brought them into captivity. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. He didn't say some thoughts. He didn't say a few thoughts. He said every thought. We're supposed to literally captivate every thought and bring them to the blood of Christ. Every thought. Uh, it's obedience to Christ. And then it's an external situation. Satan is trying to attack the gates. You've got to remember we have an enemy. We have an enemy, and he wants to get in through the gates. Through the gates. So we have the eye gate in verse 28. Then I want you to notice defeat at the gate. Uh, there are some gates the enemy can attack, but none more important than the eye gate. For instance, you say, preacher, what's some biblical examples of the eye gate? Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6, if you would. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. I'm going somewhere, so I want you to... I want you to go along with me. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. Notice what it says about Eve. And when the woman, what? Saw. Well, what does she see with? She saw with her eyes. So, when the woman saw, she saw that that tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. So, what did Satan already do? He already used that eye gate to get the woman. She looked. She lusted after the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And the tree was desired to make one wise. She took off the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. So Eve, when she saw, Joshua seven twenty one, when I saw, who said that? Achan. What did he see? He saw those Babylonian garments. He saw those things that was forbidden. And God says, no, don't you take those things. They do not belong to you, don't you? What did he do? He took them. He lusted after them. He saw them and he puts them under his garment and runs out with them and buries them somewhere underneath his tent, hides them thinking nobody knows about it, but God knew about it. And therefore men, innocent men, died as a result of sin. How did it first start? He saw. He saw. So there was an attack. Uh, how about 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 3? Uh, I want you to read this. You say, well, is it just men that lust? Well, no. Good men. Good men. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 3. The Bible says, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Well, what did he see? He saw that letter that Jezebel had wrote. And he read the letter and he got discouraged and afraid. And he thought, man, she's going to catch me and cut my head off. And he got discouraged. He saw something that he read. Now think about it. This is right after he prayed down fire. 
and killed all them prophets. And literally called fire down from heaven upon an altar and it licked up all the water. And I mean one of the greatest miracles to ever be recorded in the Old Testament. Elijah just did it. And here in, in a few verses later he's reading a letter that he sees. So be careful what your eyes read. Because it will discourage you. And he got dis depressed and discouraged. How about Matthew chapter 13 and verse 30? And when Peter saw the storm, he seen the storm. So instead of keeping his eyes on Jesus, the one that was going to rescue him, he got his eyes on the storm. I believe David knew something about the defeat at the eye gate. He said, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. In Psalms chapter uh, 119 in verse number 37. What are, what's the Bible trying to tell us to be careful little eyes what you see? Right? We sing that in, oh be careful little eyes what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Well, what's He doing? He, look, we ought to be careful what we look at because that's how the enemy attacks the eyes. We see this defeat at the gate. We see the eye gate in itself. Then we see the sacrifice at the gate. Look verse 29 and 30. If you would please. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verses 29 and 30. It says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee to have that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. This is symbolic language. What Christ was saying is thy right eye and thy right hand are very valuable to most people. But it's symbolic language. I mean, I don't know what I'd do without my right eye or my right arm I'm not left handed so I mean it's very valuable to me to have this and possess it what was Christ saying you'd be better off to go through life with something that's profitable to you but to be right with God than to hang on to it and have destruction so the meaning of any prize position and possession is caused by the temptation. If it's if it's something that is a it is a problem. I've had teenagers go to camp before and they get convicted. I'll be preaching a youth conference in Colorado here next weekend, and I'll be preaching a youth meeting this weekend in in Charlotte on Thursday and Friday or Friday uh, night and Saturday morning. And uh, in the next few weeks, I've got youth meetings at you know it's that time of the year, and they're trying to get their kids back on track after Christmas and. All that, and, and 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 you know, you go place and you preach, but teenagers all struggle. No matter if you're in California or if you're in Maine, they all struggle with the same issues. It's all the eye gate. What are they doing? And it's so accessible now. Who needs a computer when you got a cell phone? I mean, all they got to do is type in whatever they, and, and it's so. But you take that possession out of their hands and you have got somebody that doesn't know how to function in society because it is now it's become a right arm or a it's become something that's a part of their life and it, listen it doesn't matter what it is if it's causing you to stumble get rid of it get rid of it if you have an addiction to pornography addiction to uh, uh, bad things in your life I would rather you go and say I'm not having anything electronic or uh, uh, it's something, uh, a computer or whatever it is I'm not doing that because I don't want to stumble and fall and you'd be better off it's a, it's a symbolic language number two it's a personal challenge look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 1 the Bible says having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We need to cleanse ourselves. Get rid of it. Hey, uh, what's this service for? Well, if you're sitting in here today and you're having trouble with images and having trouble with looking at things, having trouble with the eye gate. See, I, you know, I'm going to be real frank with you, but you can tell when a man is a pervert. A woman can. 
we had a man in our church years ago who me and my wife, every time he talked to my wife, I did not like where his eyes went. He was an older man. One day I said, man, I'm getting up. You know, I respect this man, but I'm going to tell him, you need to keep your eyes focused somewhere else. I did. I went up to him and said, sir, I don't appreciate the way you look at my wife. She doesn't feel comfortable around you. You said, preacher, you shouldn't have done that. I absolutely should do that. I, if, if my wife doesn't, the women, God gave them an intuition that they know when they're around a dirty man. And God forbid we have dirty men at our church. I'm talking about men that still struggle. You can put on all you want to put on, but somebody knows your deep, dark, dirty secrets. It's trying to make stink smell good. You know what I mean? You just can't do it. It makes it worse. And when you get around a man who struggles in this area of the eye gate and they try and try. Folks, listen, we are living in very evil days where people literally, there is an addiction to things that we know that's not right. And I mean, it's on billboards now. It's in the grocery aisles now. It's on television. You can't watch a football game without having to turn the channel because of a naked woman promoting a hamburger. It because that's the society we live in and you, you can't even let your kids watch things because it's so vulgar and filthy and it's very hard to keep a clean mind. Hey, but we are commanded to be holy and get rid of all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How can we live holy in an evil day? Exactly this. Get rid of it. If you say, well, preacher, if it's me getting rid of my television, it'd be better for you to get rid of your television than to go around with a nasty mind. I mean, we got, folks, I'm just laying it out there for you. And again, I, this is something that teenagers have ate up all over the country. And, and where I run into a problem is more adults than I do teenagers. We're so set in our ways and, and, and we got so many problems. It's a profitable loss. Hey, you know what he said? He said, hey, you're better to go with your, without your right eye. And cast it far from you. I mean, get it out of there. If it's causing you to stumble, get that thing that profits you the most out of your life than to go through life with it and stumble. When I was a kid, uh, we used, I used to catch stuff out in the woods. We lived, man, we didn't have much as far as games and I didn't have anything. So mom and dad, in the summertime, they would kick you out of the house in the day and you didn't come back in at night, you know, in the evening. I mean, you'd come in for lunch, whatever. My mom always said, you know, no running in and out. If you're out, you stay out. And she'd lock the door. Go ahead and take a nap. And so, and I didn't have any brothers, you know, so, I mean, it was a lot of imaginary friends, amen. And uh, we'd play war and I had camouflage everything. I, I lived in it and uh, played basketball and all that, and we enjoyed the outside. But I remember I loved catching frogs, snakes, and lizards. That's all I did. We had a creek out behind the house, and we'd go catch stuff. And I, every time I caught some, I had to have a mason jar and stick it in there and screw the lid on and punch her the top, you know, so it could breathe. Sometimes I'd forget and watch it die. No, and uh, I'm joking. But, no, I, I'd... I'd uh, screw that lid on and, and put some grass down in there, you know, and all that. Yeah, everybody did it. And I remember catching a, a lizard one time and running up. I always had to show my mom. Mom, mom. She was sweeping the front. Remember, it had an old concrete porch and ran around the corner, had that lizard, caught it, you know, the one the blue, you know, good-looking lizards, you know. And I ran around the corner and had that lizard in my hand. I said, Mom, look what I caught. And I opened my hand, and the only thing in my hand was a tail. The tail had broke off. The lizard got away, and I just had a tail. And you know what that lizard said? It was better for me to get out of here with my life than to keep that which is profitable. Now, it cost that lizard something, but he's at least running around. It'd be good if some of us said, you know, it'd be better for me to go through life with something that I think is profitable to get rid of it but to keep my life, my marriage, my kids, my family, my ministry, than to be caught dabbling in things that could affect all those things. And, 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 and we, we, uh, 
I read a poem and I put this down. The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. We see victory at the gate. Look at the lust versus lust of trust. King David, Psalms 25 and verse 15, David said, Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. You know, get your eyes off temptation and put them on Jesus. You know, temptation can be conquered. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you such as common to man, but God is faithful. Temptations are going to come. You can read James chapter 1. You can read uh, all kinds of different verses and different chapters of the Bible. And, and, and the Bible itself is a purification. It's like taking a shower. In Psalms 119, uh, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. I, I read a story one time about a kid who uh, was with his grandpa. And the grandpa uh, gave him a basket. And he said, I want you to run down the creek. And I want you to stick the basket in the creek. And I want you to run back up the hill and... Give me some water in that basket. Well, the kid did. He ran down, grabbed, put the basket in the creek, and he ran back up. By the time he got to the top of the hill, there wasn't no water in the basket. The grandpa said, go down and do it again. The kid ran back down the hill and stuck his basket down there and ran back up. And uh, by the time he got there, the, ba the basket was empty. There was no water in that basket. He did it a third time. Run down the creek, get me some water, and pull it back up. And, uh, yeah, I want some water. So the kid did it. Came back, by the time he got there, the water was all gone. The kid got frustrated, threw his basket down, said, Grandpa, why is it that I'm going down the creek and you're telling me and this basket's not being, it's not able to hold the water? And the grandpa just said, I just wanted a clean basket. And you know, a lot of times we read the Bible and you're not retaining what's in it, but it's clean in your mind. It's clean in your mind. It may not be holding a whole lot, but it's clean in your mind. Because the more you read the Bible, the better it'll be for you. It's better be for your temptations, for your mind. I would love to have young people with a pure mind. I'd love to have men walking in our church and leading our ministries with a pure mind, not looking at things that's hindering us, not, not watching things that would be unholy and uh, just a bad testimony. If we're going to have a vision Sunday, in order to have vision, you must have eyes. Where there is no vision, the people perish. We have to see, Acts 20, 20. Uh, here's a local church in the area. I seen on their sign, the eye had fallen off of their sign. Their eyes missing off the sign. It just fell off and I was riding down the road. And of course, I don't know what kind of church it is. It could be a very good church, but their eyes missing. And I thought, man, I wonder how many more churches their eyes are missing. They have no vision for people. I don't want our vision to be dimmed because of sin. I want us to have a good vision, not blurred by wickedness, not blurred by temptation. Hey, if you think it's a problem, if you think it's something you shouldn't be looking at or something you shouldn't be reading. You know, there's some people, they don't look at anything worldly or uh, what we'd call sexual, so to speak, but they, they, they read things that's not right. You read after people that's not right. It's confusing, it's wrong, and it causes you... It, messes up your thinking what's what's it happening there's things coming in the eye gate but you can have victory you can have victory because psalms 25 15 mine eyes are ever toward the lord for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. i believe king david the author of that verse knew something about the eye gate didn't he he knew something about victory after he had done fail god restored him but he knew something he knew something about that net of temptation. He knew something where he should have been one day and he got in the wrong place and he out there looking and sees a woman and lusts after her and then the rest is history, the downfall of his family and the downfall. Hey, God judged him and God restored him and David being the greatest king to ever live uh, knew something about where the eye gate being corrupt will take you. I'm telling you, uh, men and women alike and teenagers and different ones, let's make sure that we are looking and reading things that would only be holy and, and, and in the sight of God and right for our conscience, for our mind. And God knows, listen, God knows what you're doing.
the preacher. You can fool the preacher for a little while. Hey, you can fool the congregation. You can fool your husband, your wife. You can fool your kids. But hey, it's going to come out one day. It's going to come out. It'll come out. I would rather be behind the times and be a little a called a fuddy-dud, an old-timer, but to have a holy conscience and a right conscience than to be up with the times and technology and be dabbling in filthy, filthy things. Why? Because, hey, the devil wants to get us, doesn't he? You ever been, I, 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 you know, if you sit up here and, or you're preaching a little bit, and uh, you, you're you're watching folks, and I can be scanning a whole auditorium, no matter where I'm preaching, but especially here, and be looking. Let's say on a Sunday morning, places full, and you can be watching people, and you can go across, and boy, you see people smiling and shaking their head, and you can see people just, and all of a sudden, bam, you see somebody in there, or and you're like, you know. What's wrong with that person? Now, sometimes it's not sin. Sometimes it's discouragement. You know, I, I, I can't look inside someone's heart like the Holy Spirit. And, but, you know, you often wonder, if that is that person right with the Lord? Man, they don't even look like they want to be here. And they're all just, they're miserable. You know what starts? I believe sometimes the devil gets someone distracted, like we talked about this morning, distracted. And before you know it, they're looking at things they have no business looking at. My challenge to you today is think about this for a little bit. I know it's just more of a teaching, but I've taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teenagers this same thought that we ought to be careful what we look at. We ought to be careful. That's, that's going to be an attack. I'm just going to tell you right now, the devil is on the attack. Dad, be the dad you're going to be. You the dad you ought to be. But you look at things that are only right before God and 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 uh, and ladies the same way and teenage boys the same way and teenage girls hey let's be right in the sight of God I've got a son down here I've got two daughters over here I want to be the dad but as an example I remember a kid that was in our youth group he was struggling he, he grew up in our church his family grew up in our church and uh, he all of a sudden started just going crazy. I mean, rebellious. His mom couldn't do nothing with him. His dad, they'd come to me and say, Preacher, is there anything you can do? Can you counsel? Can you talk with this young man? I said, Sure. And we did. We talked for a little while. And finally, that young man opened up to me. He's 18, 19 years old, done been in, in, you know, in a lot of trouble with the law. And he said, uh, I'll tell you what my problem is. He said it real, real disrespectful. I'll tell you what my problem is. My dad. And I said, well, what, what about your dad? And he said, well, I'll tell you what he is. He sits up there on the front row. He sings in the choir. He works on the bus. But he's a fake. And I said, wow, that's pretty strong. And I said, why is he a fake? He said, because when I was a little boy, I was 10 years old, my dad gave, gave me uh, an allowance. And he told me, I'll give you allowance if you'll go out there and clean my work truck. And he said, go out there and clean it out every week. I'll give you some money. He said, I started cleaning out my dad's work truck. He said, one night I flipped the, or one day I flipped the, the back of his seat up, just a single cab truck, and behind that truck, behind that bed there, was, was some dirty books. He said, my heart, he said, preacher, I can't describe to you the pain that came in my heart knowing that my dad was looking at that stuff. He said, I put it back. I was scared. I thought... I get caught in trouble. You know, if he caught me, he'd, he'd, he'd whip me good. And he said, I put him back. And he said, but ever since then, I thought, man, my dad. He said, I actually thought, well, maybe it was a mistake. Somebody else was driving his truck. And, they're, they're, you know, they, different men would drive it at times. And, uh, but it was his. And sure enough, he went back several weeks later, and there was different. And he said, I started looking at it. He said, I would secretly take those things and my dad would not know it. And I'd look at it and I'd put it back. My dad knowing that he was doing. By the way, that family today, blown all to pieces. That boy, though, still keeps in touch with me at times. That boy's been out of church for years. Got two or three children by two or three different women. Living an awful life. And I really, truly believe, Brother Wayne, I believe it all started at a young age when that boy lost confidence in his dad because his dad wasn't living right. And putting on a facade. 
And it messed that whole thing up. And it all started with this. And went to this. I think we need to take heed to what the Word of God says. And protect.